Since the release of Apple's M1 MacBooks, they've been universally lauded as the fastest machines ever delivered. And for good measure, they've been crushing every benchmark in its path, leaving older laptops in dust. While benchmarks are great at using a standard measure to compare performance, it doesn't always translate to everyday use. What good is a benchmark if using the device is painful? So I have the 16 inch M1 MacBook Max with 32 gigs of RAM and two terabytes of uh, storage. And I will give you my thoughts on six areas of the laptop after a month of use. If you're new to my channel, my name is Sam and I do tech reviews and tutorials to help you become a better digital citizen. So the new M1 Max is at least the 16 inch version is slightly heavier than its predecessor, uh, but not by much. Uh, I think a lot of people think it's a lot heavier because it's got this nice, really dense feel to it. But yes, it is slightly heavier and you obviously wouldn't be using this for your everyday carry. This is meant to be a pro machine and, and not to be something you're carrying around every day. Uh, you could, but you really don't want to. This is meant to be more of a desktop machine than anything else. It's a boxy, squarish, rectangular kind of design. Uh, it does have the feel of a really, really pro, serious pro machine. For all intents and purposes, the dimensions are pretty much identical to the 2019 version. There, there's very slight differences. A, the previous 2019 and 18 and 17 versions had that tapered design that gives you the illusion of thinness, which really wasn't there. They obviously went with the square design, gives them extra space for battery, and I'll take it. The speakers on this thing are absolutely amazing. I was watching reviews as I was waiting for mine to come, and to be honest, the videos do not do it justice. They sound spectacular. They are very well balanced, and the extra subwoofers and the bass makes a lot of difference. I honestly found myself not going for my AirPods as much as I did in the past. And yes, ports are finally back. I now know how my three-year-old feels. If I punish him by taking away a toy, after I give it back to him, he's jumping up and down with joy. That's how I feel. And I guess Apple is our daddy. Okay, let's talk about the ports they did bring back. The first one and one that we didn't think we were gonna get was the HDMI port, which is great to have. Uh, the only thing is this port is a 2.0 spec versus a 2.1. And that really is not gonna mean much to 99% of the users since most people like me are probably going to be using this in a conference room and plugging it directly into a TV screen. Uh, and most TV screens will be fine with using the 2.0 port. The 2.1 would be something if you're a gamer and you want to do it at a high refresh rate screen. Nobody would really do that. I usually found myself forgetting a dongle when I go into a conference room and this is great to have. Uh, 2.0 will be fine. The other thing I wish they did, since this is a pro machine, I would have liked it if they made this an input instead of just only an output. I would have loved to be able to connect my camera to it and use it as a monitor or use it as another input source for a video. The only way to really do this is to actually connect the USB and use your drivers and to connect it as a webcam, which is kind of annoying, but I'll take what I can get. Now for the USB-C Thunderbolt ports. Uh, we unfortunately now have three instead of four, but the good thing is that they are Thunderbolt 4 and it gives you much more bandwidth to transfer larger files quicker. And you can also now connect uh, two 4K displays and one 8K display. Now, for most people, if they're gonna be using multiple monitors, they're probably gonna be using some sort of dock. Uh, I can't see you connecting to three monitors and just taking away all your USB-C ports you have no capability to connect an external drive or anything else for that matter. So most people will be using a dock and that dock will provide you more ports to actually connect external drives and to connect and drive your monitors at the same time. Hyper has just released a dock that supports the M1 and allows you to connect your monitors and a lot of external peripherals without much of a fuss. I have one in order and it will be coming sometime mid-December supposedly. So when I get that, I will be reviewing it. So consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell so you can get notified when that is out. And now MagSafe. It's about time they brought this back and I have no idea why they even took it away. This was an engineering marvel by Apple and it distinguished them from every other manufacturer. So why would they even want to take this away? MagSafe was so iconic and it just showed the brilliance of Apple's engineering team at the time. So the good thing is you can charge with both MagSafe and the USB-C ports. 
Uh, the difference is that MagSafe supports 140 watts of pass-through power, so you can actually charge to 50% within 30 minutes. USB-C and Thunderbolt 4 is only limited to 100 watts, so you won't get fast charging using those, but you can charge with that as well. The magnet holding the cord uh, in place is fairly strong, and I can see where people, I don't have it plugged in at this moment charging, but as you can see, it is fairly strong and I can drag it around and I can see why people, some people think that, you know, could still knock it off a table if somebody trips over the cable. Uh, moving it upwards pops it out very easily. It's something to consider. Uh, I think most people, if they have it on their laps and somebody tries to trip over a cord, I think that would more dangerous because you could probably rip especially when they were USB-C you could probably rip the connector right off and that'd be more of a pain so I kind of like that they have it but yeah it is a little bit too strong if you do a lateral pull but if you move upwards it pops right out so that's good so the next one is the SD card slot I love that they have this here uh, as a pro machine that's what you need uh, I obviously recording videos here and I need the SD card to actually pull my images out. In the past, they used an expensive SD card reader that could actually read at the max speed of my card. I use V90 cards and those cards can transfer to about 300 megabytes per second. And after testing it, I could see that the MacBook and my external SD card reader read at the same exact time, which is great. This may not be useful for other people, but again, this is a pro machine. They should provide everything that a pro would probably need. The one thing I'm not too fond of, it sticks out a little bit too much, but I could see another failure point if you use one of those clicky types where it clicks all the way in and you have to click it out. That's just something else that could fail. So the keyboard is as boring as it should be. It's exactly what it needed to be. It doesn't have any of the issues in the past. It doesn't seem like it. The typing experience has been great and I hated the old keyboards. It felt like I was just typing directly on a piece of board. So just to give you a better idea of what the keyboard looks like and maybe feels like, I have an Apple Magic Keyboard here. And when I'm typing on both this one and this one, the feel is pretty much identical. So that's a welcome feature to have back. So this keyboard always felt good to me. I always kind of like the way it feels the way it typed. And this one actually feels the same way. Uh, I obviously love that they have the function keys now. I hated the touch bar and I hated it so much so that I even forgot that it was there. Uh, most of the things that the touch bar can do, you can do with keystroke commands. There might be some niche use cases for the touch bar. I never had one. I kind of hated that I had to click twice just to get to the volume button and all these can be done with the function keys without a problem and I'm glad that it's back. So the screen is absolutely gorgeous. Again on a YouTube video that's not something you're going to experience other than me telling you that it is fantastic. Uh, the blacks are blacker if that makes sense and it makes everything seem so much crisper and beautiful to view at. This is really something you'll have to go experience yourself before purchasing this laptop if that's what you want. Some people may complain that there may be some haloing around some things. I haven't really noticed it. And to be honest, the old LED panels, they pretty much the whole thing was a halo if everything was dark. So this is a thousand times better than before. So the webcam on this is finally serviceable. It doesn't look like a cheap $10 webcam like the one I have behind here, uh, but it's serviceable, it looks fine. So here's what the webcam looks like on the M1 Max. It, nothing spectacular, but it's at least passable. It's better than what it used to be. Uh, the image you're seeing is without any post-processing. Not sure if YouTube is doing any processing at all, but this is what it looks like. And as you can tell, the microphones sound fantastic. I'm not doing any post-processing in the audio that's being recorded. This is just the way it is straight out of the MacBook. It sounds great. Uh, great mics. I wish the camera was better too. Okay, so let's talk about the notch. The notch doesn't personally bother me and I can honestly see the reasoning behind it. There would be a bezel there that would just go wasted away, so why not take advantage of it? The only concern is why not make it a little bit smaller since you only have a webcam there. 
Um, many people think that there should have been Face ID there, but I kind of disagree. I don't understand what Face ID would be beneficial other than potentially just unlocking your Mac. I'm always going to have my hands on my keyboard and the Touch ID sensor is right there and I can use it at any moment. And on my phone, if I want to use Face ID to make a purchase or something else, for example, I have to use a second motion, which is hitting the power button twice to actually accept that. Wouldn't you have to do something similar on a laptop? You wouldn't want an application to suddenly pop a Face ID, approve this purchase, or a Face ID launch this application, and because you're staring at the screen, automatically just executes. You would have to do something. Hit the space bar twice, hit space something. So if your hands are already at the keyboard, what's the difference with just putting your finger on the Touch ID? Now, there may be a way that they will use Face ID because I could see that maybe there's some people that can't use Touch ID or for whatever other reason. I just don't see it as a really necessity on this laptop. So for most users, they're going to have this machine docked somewhere. So even if you have Face ID on this laptop, every time you want to use it when it's docked, you would have to do something like this all the time. And if your monitor is closed as well, since you have it docked, it's just going to become a nuisance. Whereas if you're using an external keyboard or if you're using Apple's external keyboard that has Touch ID, you can actually use that. Another thing, if your hands are over the keyboard as well, and most people these days are touch typists, you can probably type your password faster than you could actually lift the lid of your screen and just look at it to do Face ID. The performance of this machine is as fantastic as everybody's been claiming. I've been using this for a month and I am amazed at what I can do with it. I've been currently running Windows 11 on a Parallels VM this whole time. Let me get this on the screen. While doing an update, while doing a Windows update and using the machine at the same time. The battery has not flinched. It is, if I can get it here. The battery is still at 100%. The fans have not spun up once. If I attempted to do this with my 2017 MacBook Pro, the fans would have spun up the second I said start Windows 10 at that time with Parallels VM. And not only would the fans spin up, it was so hot I could not put this on my lap. It was it would torch my legs. So this thing has been an utterly amazing experience so far using it performance wise. Uh, using Final Cut Pro and doing videos, it is really fast, surprisingly fast. I hit render on things and before I even blinked, it's done. I've never seen that on previous MacBooks before. So yes, it is fantastic, it is powerful, and it is very quiet. And I'm amazed at all this power. And if I go to the settings, I don't even have the full performance on because in the, the settings, if you go to battery on the M1 Max, you actually have the option to turn this to high power that unleashes the full potential of the M1 Max chip. Of course, it will spin up the fans a little bit more because it would generate more heat. But it, it is amazing to know that there's so much more power available to me if I need it and I haven't even thought I needed it yet. So this is a utterly fantastic machine. If you're a pro and you want to use this, you, can't, you just can't go wrong. Now on to the battery life. Battery life is fantastic. Uh, as you can see, I'm running Windows 11 on a Parallels VM and I've been recording the video. I've been recording for about 45 minutes so far and the battery is still at 100%. I was editing a video on Final Cut Pro yesterday and with footage that was over 100 gigs in size that had to be rendered all the time. I started using the laptop and it was at about 60%. Four hours later, the battery was at 35. There is no way I could do this with any previous MacBook trying to do that kind of work with that size of files and doing that much processing power, the, the laptop would just not last that long. I'd be lucky to get 30 minutes to an hour before I would have to plug it in. One thing though, take Apple's claimed 21 hour battery life with a grain of salt. If you look at their fine print, they will say that in order to get the 21 hours, you have to do specific things. You have to use one of the videos from their approved list. You have to turn Wi-Fi off and there is a couple of other things, I think Bluetooth and some other things. Only then can you get the 21 hours of battery life. I get it. They have to have a standard set of rules in order to compare this against others. 
but it is buried in the fine print. Regardless, the battery is amazing. It is the best battery life I've seen in a laptop so far. Now, would I recommend this laptop? If you're a professional, if you're doing uh, web development, coding, or anything else that would require a lot of intensive power, then yes, this machine is for you. This machine will allow you to save time, and time is money. So if you can save, let, let's say you're a software engineer like me, and you need to constantly build code. So you will build something, then you may find something when you're testing that doesn't work quite right, you have to go back in, change something, build again. Every time you're building, you could take three, four, five minutes to build, if not longer, depending on how much code you have to build. With this one, I can actually build the same code base in maybe a minute. That is a huge savings of time. If you add all those up, that could be almost an hour a day, because sometimes you have to build multiple times a day, 10, 11, 12, depending on what you're fixing and what you're testing out and trying again and testing out. That's a humongous amount of time saving. If you extrapolate that out for a year, it could easily pay for the price of this laptop. So yes, if you're a professional and you do that kind of work and time is money and valuable to you, then yes, this laptop's for you. If you just need a laptop just to do everyday things, then no, this is not for you. This is way too much power. I have an M1 Mac mini and I use that for just everyday things and it's just been perfectly fine. I never had a need to do anything else. You could easily do browsing, web browsing, documents, if I wanna write a letter, email, all those basic things, it is perfectly fine. If you're looking for something like a laptop for an everyday carry, the M1 Air would be a perfect substitute for this. This is just not something you would need for that kind of use. If you're looking to become a Notion Ninja, check out my playlist up here on the new video series that I've started on Notion for Beginners. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.